Hello, welcome to Sava Talk Spurs. I am, of course, Sava, and today it's not about me at all. It's about this wonderful gentleman, uh, Mr. Steve Perryman. Uh, this is the second time you've graced me with your presence. So, first of all, welcome, and how are you? Thank you very much. I'm fine. Um, thank you very much for inviting me again. So, uh, been a busy few days. I was up in Norfolk on, uh, drove up Thursday, did a talk on Friday at Thetford, uh, stayed at my wife's uh, father's house, drove back Saturday, uh, went out for a nice Sunday lunch yesterday, of course got back in time for the game, and then um, been thinking about it ever since. And um, so what? let's start with that then. What what did you make of it, Steve? It was... Um... It was billed to be a real classic, and then um, it, it turned out to be that way by hook or crook. Well, what did you think of it? Yeah, I suppose it depends on what you call a classic, but um, <laughs> True. certainly full of fire, full of energy. Um, they they looked a bit more fired up and a bit more energetic than us for mm -hmm. a large part of the game, I have to say. But um, but there was also a resilience about us, and. Mm -hmm. um, Again, any performance you'll see, no no one's going to control a game for 90 minutes. Um, and therefore, there must be a spell where we came back into it. Yeah, And there was sort of doubt about our two goals. But, uh, you know, how many times have we said that against us? Yeah. So, um, so, yeah, I think we were slightly lucky to get the draw, but delighted with it. And I think that... Uh, I think Conte is the real deal. I really do. I think he's added to the competitiveness of us mm -hmm. that was sorely needed. Um, I've, I've sort of got fed up with saying this. People think it's my, um, you know, <laughs> four games we did not lay a glove on them last year. Yeah. And yeah. Um, of course, the season finished off great and we're in the Champions League and Thursday is not Spurs Day, but um, but yeah, a um, lot of the same players from last year that mm -hmm. that underperformed in certain games. Yeah, so it's not all over yet. Uh, it's going to be really interesting when he starts involving the new players, uh, which surely he's got to do at some point because of resting and injuries and suspensions. <laughs> I mean, the manager's the only one suspended so far. But, um, but yeah, so uh, it's it, it started off a very interesting season. Um, you know, Southampton, I don't think anyone was too surprised that we sort of rolled them over. But actually, we've been behind in two games now. And two out of two. And, and we've come back from it without losing. And I think the resilience part was shown when we were a goal down... And we're sort of struggling a bit against a very good team. And we didn't buckle under to allow the second goal. And, of course, they kept saying it on telly, oh, where they're only, you know, one behind. Chelsea have dominated, but Spurs are only one behind. They can come back. Yeah. And I think that was some confidence in Conte's ability to make changes and Conte's ability to read the game and read what happened and do the appropriate stuff and and he obviously did it and then obviously when he when he when he brought on the new players um particularly uh Richarlison um there was just a, a, a vibrancy about us and that resulted in in a goal what would we have been saying if we don't get the last goal mm, we're not quite there we're not right. quite going to challenge for the top three, um, possibly. Um, but, but uh, yeah, I, as I said, I think he's the real deal. And um, I think I think he's got the players and he's got the boardroom where he wants them. And, and have, can I ask then, Steve, have you had the pleasure of meeting Antonio Conte? Never, have you met him yet? Never, ne no. no. Um, Does he look like the sort of manager you'd like to play for? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I think he likes consistency of effort. I think he mm -hmm. likes consistency of devilment, mm -hmm. if you know what I mean. 
Yep, and, yep. Um, he sort of, I think, wants to play your game for you. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> putting you in position. And I think that's where that's where him and Ericsson didn't quite get on. Ericsson's a sort of free spirit, a free mind, a free look. Uh, yes, yeah. It, so he didn't want to be tied down. So I never actually expected Ericsson to, to sign for us. Uh, as much as sometimes I thought maybe, well, we could do with him. He's tight anyway. Yeah. So um, uh, I, I think it's about getting his trust. Yeah. And I think towards the end of the season, a lot of players did themselves a favour you know, working that trust element from Conte. And um, and therefore, you know, he started off with the same sort of team that finished. So, um, yeah. Uh, but I think, I don't think he's a fool by any means. I think he's very clever. I think he's the, a winner type. And I, and I wonder about, you know, people that think, that a man who rants and raves on a touchline is passionate. <laughs> I think he is. But, you know, I said to someone one day when I got accused of my Watford team drew with Barry Fry's uh, Watford right. and uh, at home and someone wrote me a letter and said, well, it's official. It's official. Um, Barry Fry's got more, more um, passion about football than Steve Perriman has. <laughs> anyway, so the fellow very kindly left his number. So, of course, I'm going to phone it up, and I'm going to say, go on, and how do you see passion? What do you see? He said, charging up and down the touchline like a, like a, and I added the words, like a demented cat. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, i got to tell you, I find it very hard to think when I'm, Ranting and raving, mm -hmm. yeah, lot to be said. And a lot that. of the time, when you've just scored, you need to think. Mm -hmm. You need to think. How has this changed the game? And um, so, I like I like what I see. I don't think he's acting. If I thought he was acting, I'd say so. But uh, I think it's genuine, and I think the players have fed off his aggression and his. He's, yeah, he's, he's alive, isn't he? He's 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 kicking every ball, and um, I, I always think that your 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 um, your your positive things about you, your your abilities, can also work against you. And right. I've not seen it work against him yet, I have to say. And <laughs> um, his team has just recovered from two losing positions, to to one get a win and two get the draw. So we're unbeaten in two games, which is great. So, um, you know, a draw and a win, does it mean that we're less of a team than we were last year when we got two 1-0 wins? No. We, we've got more about us. He's added something there. And, um, you know, Spursy, I think, is going to get less mentions this year than, than for a number of years. And that's no I bad thing. Hopefully, Steve. Hopefully, just just quickly, just before we go on. Uh, look, first of all, thank you very much, everyone. Um, saying hello to you, Steve, in the chat, saying that you were their, their captain, their leader. Um, if you have got any questions for Steve, please put them in the chat. If they're sensible, I will put them to Steve. If they're not, I will delete them. Um, we've had a first question for Steve, uh, which was something I was going to ask you anyway, is Dylan, who I know very well, has said, Steve, what similarities do you think Conte and Sir Bill Nick share if any, how would you say they differ? Very difficult for me to to um, to answer that because I I was um, of course I signed for Tottenham Hotspur in front of about thirty five other clubs mm. because of Bill Nicholson. Wow, Mister, you Tottenham. had thirty five offers. Well, yes, and the reason being, I don't want to go over old ground, but I um, I didn't come to prominence till my under-15 year. Yeah. And therefore, um, I got put in for the district trials. I got in. We won 9-1, and that afternoon, 
Um, so that was in the morning. That afternoon, Charlie Faulkner is knocking on our door saying, sign this form and, and you can come training. And my brother, who was only four years older than me, said, uh, no, Charlie, he, he won't be signing that. Ted, what do you mean not sign? <laughs> he said, no, 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 you, you, you're you not going to sign that. I said, why not? He said, because if you sign that, you've got to sign for that club when you leave school. Right. So, uh, so he said, Charlie, if I'm right, he he can come training to you without signing that form. And Charlie said, actually, that's right, Ted. You, yeah, you are, you are right. So ironically, I went all through that season Ealing to Middlesex to London to England schoolboys. So I'm playing in front of 100,000 at Wembley against Scotland. And I must be the only schoolboy not signed for anyone because of my brother, because of my late entry into that sort of sphere. And um, so, of course, anyone watching that game at near the end of the season would have a, would have a, a chance to sort of think they could sign me. I'm a home bird. I was never going to leave London. Right. So, um, and actually to sign for Tottenham was, was a bit of a wrench because I'm a West Londoner and it was two hours door to door. And for a 15 year old leaving school, four hours on your day, a physical job, like, you know, professional, uh, I'm an apprentice, but you're yeah. in professional football. So it was a hell of a strain actually. And, um, but anyway, I, I did sign. And so I was under Bill Nicholson's sort of guidance as a from a 15 years old onward. And I think right. I played him for about probably eight, nine years. And um, so it was a different relationship then between a player and a manager. I If Bill Nicholson had said run through that wall, I would have done. And I think these days, players with agents and influences of course my brother was influencing me but mm -hmm. not for a fee um you know they say oh hold on a minute not sure about that and so neither neither suffer falls and i would Absolutely. say that's the biggest that's the biggest uh thing i can say so can i ask you then Steve, so I just want to ask you, so when, obviously now with social media and everything being covered by Sky Sports and BT Sport and everything like this, we all feel like we know these managers and these players and their personalities and they're larger than life. But when you were joining Spurs, obviously everyone knew who Bill Nick was because, sorry, Sir Bill Nick, who he was because of the double winning team, etc. But did, did, did you know much more about him other than he was just the manager of Spurs? Did you know his personality as you were going in to meet him? Uh, no. Well, he came around my house um, to try and encourage me to sign. I saw him on various training nights because although I didn't sign that form, I did train regularly at Spurs. The fact I didn't sign it meant I was allowed to sort of go and look at other clubs for like a couple of days at Easter holidays or etc. And mm -hmm. And I just knew that he was he was in love with his club and he was in love in football being played the right way. Right. So his ethics were were top, top class. Um, in all the time I played for him, listened to him, uh, spoke on the phone probably once a month when I was in Japan. So now I've left, he's left. Mm -hmm. No reason to sort of stick together, but I did by phone calls. And he he carried down a, a line of Steve, just do it right. Just yeah. do it right. And I think Conte's on the same on the same page as that. I mean, you can't imagine anyone saying, Well, just do it right now and again. I mean, yeah. Cool. <laughs> yeah. But, but the, the 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 constant messages, the constant driving and the leading, I think is is something that they sort of share. And you know what what I would say is a little bit of a warning to to the players that have been retained there. He would have seen some weakness when he took over. He would have mm -hmm. seen some weakness on odd occasions during the rest of the season. 
and you know he's not going to jump on people he's not going to necessarily you know banish them but it will be in his brain and therefore uh, and i'll tell you why it should be because there's been players oh you know that didn't want to play for manager a or b but fancy plan for this manager manager mm -hmm. c well any manager looking at that would say hold on a minute that might be me one day yeah. so so i think they're giving him signs every day as per the depth of their of their commitment to the club to because when they when they don't want to play for manager a or b that's a very that's very much a lack of commitment to their club and to right. the supporters you know we're never always going to meet the manager of our dreams who's gonna who's gonna put us on the new level he's found the new way to to help us become the player that we dreamt of that, you know you've got to be very lucky i mean if you're ryan Giggs and you sign it whatever he did 15 16 and you have 25 years and they're all with alex ferguson and he happened to be the right man for you which it seemed like he was then you know that's utopia great but some clubs have four managers a year <laughs> this one might be good for you that one might be bad for you that one might be middle for you and you just got to get on with it because you're playing for that club you're playing for that shirt you're playing for them supporters mm -hmm. so so i would say he is judging them players every day every single day as per could they do to me what they've done to a couple of others and therefore you know any any manager looks at a group of players and says i've either get him out get him out or he'll get me out and right. uh, you know that that's that's always at the back of your mind sometimes not at the forefront because you've got to get results and you've got to get into games and and get your messages across but i i um i i like his spirit i like he must he must have passed on this spirit to to the players i think um i think eric dyer for instance who who is a is a is a decent player um but he needed to liven his game up whenever whenever we played poorly it came down to not enough tempo, <laughs> right. not enough tempo. well okay oh, let's go a bit that that's almost like saying from a captain's point of view come on <laughs> i can come on it's not landed on anyone yeah who are you telling to come on so so i would say that when you're playing a back three and one of them's a midfield player gone to the back so he can handle the ball he's got to be responsible as anyone for the tempo of the team because if he gets it and goes sideways and then it comes back and he goes sideways again and then he passes it to the full back uh, that's matched up so it's got to come back there's not too much tempo about that is there so um i think the the the, the spare player at the back be it in this situation eric dyer and the goalkeeper uh, uh to did you see the comment on telly the other day about the the referees are, are clamping down on goalkeepers because they're yes. the biggest the biggest line into wasting time right, right. they're also the line in to playing quick Get it? Okay. Move it. You can't you can't play it to someone that's marked. Of course not. But if he's not got options and he needs to play quick because we're a goal behind, well, and you're the captain, by the way, start telling them they got to get out sharper. Do, do you see what I mean? So, and and if everyone's picked up and then Eric drops off, he gives it to him and then he plays quick and and feeds it through. So. So I think uh, I think Eric has, has has picked up his tempo of what I've seen. Just just passing the ball to to the next player, yeah, about fifteen percent, and and it, it don't have to be fifty percent. Fifteen percent is just enough. a bit more than what it was. Boom, get it. Boom, get it. Yeah, Boom. and uh, so can, can I ask then, Steve? So obviously you're saying about. 
different how different players play for different managers, etc. You you've played in the dressing room for Bill Nick and then for Keith Birkinshaw, who were both very successful in their own right. But when Keith Birkinshaw came in and you had the nucleus of the players that were still playing for Bill Nick at the time, because I don't believe back in those days there was eight in and eight out like there is these days. No. What were the players, what was their reaction to, to, to Birkinshaw coming in? And did you see that there were players visibly that weren't going to play for Birkinshaw the way they would for Bill Nicholson? Um, again, difficult question, but uh, remember there's Terry Neal in between. Yes, sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Terry Neal bought Keith to the club. He bought in yeah. a new professional sort of professionalism with regard to the physiotherapy and stuff. Um, so there was a lot he did right, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Terry Neal. And I have to say, when I do talks to Spurs groups, they like me to give Terry some stick. And I can't do it because he was mm. actually good for my game. Right. Um, with regard to giving me a bit more freedom to get in front of the ball. I never got in front of the ball, really, with Bill Nick. I, I was always the the sort of blanket that others could go forward. And then when they got caught out, because it don't always work, then yeah. I was the first one in to sort of blanket the ball. Yeah. So, um, I, I yeah, I, I, of course, there was no doubt you get on better with some managers than others yeah that should not detract from your from your work rate from your competitiveness and your um mentality sure if you've got a mentality you've got a strong mentality for bill nick and then there's a change that you don't quite you don't think he's as good as Bill Nick actually, and there's a lot to suggest that Keith wasn't as good as Bill Nick in terms of the results. Now, when we're looking back, yeah, and the fact that his first season, he you know he got relegated, we got relegated, and how Keith kept his job in amongst that, well, that's another. It must be another era, but um, but basically, you've you've if you. If you was under Bill Nick and you you learned your trade, which is what he what he gave you, he he treated you like an apprentice carpenter or plumber or whatever. Um, you learned your trade. You obviously have got to go and put those things um, in your game. Keep them in your game for the new manager. And if then he stops the training too many times and says. That's wrong what you're doing. You shouldn't be doing it. You shouldn't be passing that ball. Well, the fact that Bill Nick gave it to me, I think I'd have an argument with him. <laughs> you know what I mean? You, yeah, absolutely. You're not going to get anywhere by just being a yes man. You, and, and I say this about captaincy. Captaincy is not a popularity contest. You've got to be... Pre if you're not going to be prepared to fall out with a manager... Or fall out with some players, you're not going to be a very good captain. Yeah. Because you've got to say it like it is. And hopefully that's a brain saying it like it is. And I think I had a football brain. And um, so so you you listen to the new manager's instructions. I suppose the fact that I was captain under Keith, even when we got relegated, so it must have had something to do with me. You you use the moments out of the training area to discuss, are you sure? I was talking to Keith Birkenshaw today, and he said, I think one of my problems might have been that I, I wanted us to be known as a football team, a good yeah. football team. And I said, Keith, that is not a weakness. And I reckon at least 80% of our supporters, if questioned, what was Keith's strengths? They would say because he tried to play the right way. Yeah, and try, try is the optimum word because it ain't always going to work. So, um, but but I made the point to Keith, and I'm even saying it today, all these years later. Keith, let me tell you, I told you on the day, and I told you a number of times after, when we played a nine v nine across half a pitch with big goals. So it's like a mini mini game. Yeah. Um, you couldn't help yourself to praise the bit of skill. And that's great. That's great. So Glenn flourished. 
the, the talented players, of course, flourished. Ozzy, you know, loved training. Of course he did. If you want us to be better defenders, you've got to start praising the player that sees the problem, closes the ball and gets it in the right in the face with the ball because he's protected his goal. Yeah. If you don't praise that, that ain't going to come out in... in Players are going to do what they're praised for. Because because what the manager does by praising, it's like when the crowd, when I when I got in the team as a 17-year-old, I weren't really known as a tackler. But in energy and desire to stay in that team and get selectable, I started going into tackles. Yeah. And they were giving me a reaction like I'd scored a goal. Well, they're saying, Steve, we like that. Keep doing that. Now, once you've suggested you can do it, you can't take it away. Because they'll be after three months, they'll be saying, thought he was a tackler, he ain't really. Mm, no, no, I got that wrong. Anyway, so um can, can I ask Steve you something you just brought up there? And when I look at that period of time, now I was born in 82. So unfortunately, I I missed a lot of those trophies that sort of came within your uh within your in your time at the club. But, it looked like we had a lot of teams that won a lot of trophies for, from the in the seventies and eighties. How on earth did we then get relegated? What 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 happened? Was that and 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 how how bad is that memory for you, or was it just a, sure. a wake up call? Okay, so um, right, so we was never a league team mm. in my two best eras, which was early 70s, early 80s. Yep. Well, that meant we lacked a consistency. We could play at the time. At that moment, we could play. There'd be moments where we'd go three or four, you know, with one draw, two defeats, another draw. So that, that you ain't going to be a league team like that. Uh, probably 82 was the closest we got to being a league team when I think we got overpowered by a number of games. But um, do you know the other night I, I mentioned to you early that I spoke, uh, I did a talk at Thetford, yeah. Norfolk. And I knew that Jimmy Pierce, now there's a name for the older supporters listening to this. I know that Jimmy Pierce lived, in the Ipswich area. So I hadn't spoken to Jim for about 40 something years. Wow. So I found his number from someone and phoned him up and said, Jim, I'm doing this talk. Would you like to come along? And he said, yes, yeah, Steve, I'd love to. And we, we had a talk about Bill Nick and Eddie Bailey and those times, the 70s, early seventies, Jimmy Greaves, Mike England, Pat, Gilly, Chiv. And, um, and he came along and I, I didn't realise, I thought Jimmy Pierce got a bad tackle and finished his career, which was a which was such a, a tragedy. Bill Nicholson loved Jimmy Pierce and he always saw that, and, and Bill Nick never overdid anything in praise. And he'd never say this to Jimmy himself, but he said it to the newspapers. He was convinced that Jimmy Pierce was good enough to take over from from. Jimmy Greaves. There was three players that got injured and finished in the same year. Uh, Jimmy Pierce, Peter Collins, who was going to replace Mike England, and Roger Morgan. Roger Morgan was different to the other two because, well, actually, they're all different. One was homegrown, one was out of the non-league, Chelmsford, Peter Collins, and one was bought from a from a so-called lesser club, QPR, who I'd supported. So <laughs> you're over lesser. Anyway, so is that, um, could you say, is that Roger Morgan? Was he one of the twins? Is he yes, one of the Morgan yeah, twins? Yeah, Ian and Roger. Yeah. So, I, saw, so when I, I, saw, I saw their development. I used to watch the youth team play at QPR. And they come up in a very good youth team with people like Frank Sibley and Ron Hunt and 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 that sort of caliber of player. They they so what I'm saying is these were three young talents that all finished in the same year. Yeah. Well, guess what? To be as good as you were the start of the previous year, you've got to replace those three talents and a couple more. Right, yeah. Because, yeah, because 
you know, when you like experience in your team, which Bill Nick did, seems strange to say for a 17 year old that he put in, but if Bill Nick loved a bit of uh, experience <laughs> and he loved a bit of height, well, I weren't experienced and I weren't tall. And actually <laughs> liked a bit of pace as well and I weren't quick. So I must, I say to people, I must have had something because I, I, I never had what he wanted, really. <laughs> but, so, but, but what I think I had was I had a, an anticipation that he loved. He loved it. And for a midfield player in those days, ball up to the front, lay back and play through. It was that anticipation when it's not a particularly lay back, it's a fight ball that might come back here and are you on it quick? We'd say second ball, wouldn't we? So, um, so Bill Nick was coming to the end of his tether nobody is going to be as good at the end as what they were in the middle of their career um so when you think bill nick sort of took over in uh 59 was it and won the double in 61 um he he's bill nick's judgment was going and and you would yeah, you would see that by the by the the signings we were making, and uh, I know people like fancy Alfie Con. Um, Alfie Con weren't what we we needed at the time. Alfie Con was sort of did his own stuff really. So, um, uh, so once you start losing these three, I mean, three players is almost a third of your team. Yeah, yeah. Do you think it's eleven plus a one because? A lot of years, that's how it was. One sub. Okay, a third, three players is is a quarter of your team. So that takes a bit of um, a bit of replacing. So, um, you know, Bill Nick let uh, Sunesco, for instance. Well, with Suness in the team, we wouldn't have got relegated. I, I got to tell you. And although it was a different Graham Suness to the one that you we all know about and love or hate according to your support yeah uh, you know football brain it's, it's obvious football brain and um it was more of a flair player then actually so um so he would have been the one that you you wouldn't have to buy Alfie Con if you had him there right so right it, it's those decisions you know Bill Nick for instance and I love him I love Bill Nick and I, I should never criticise him whatsoever, but you've asked the question. <laughs> um, you know, he swapped, um, uh, he swapped Jimmy Robertson for the lad from Arsenal, Dave Jenkins. If you, if you find a, a Tottenham supporter these days that think that was a good move, <laughs> I'll suffer <laughs> anything. Yeah. Because it weren't, it weren't a good move. So, but you don't know what the story is behind the scenes, right? They live in their life and etc. So, you know, Jimmy Greaves was a typical one. You know, who knows? Who knows that Greaves? It was an alcoholic. I certainly didn't. The youngster in the team, he weren't drinking with me. Yeah, I yeah. weren't. I weren't on offer to go drinking with them. <laughs> you see what I mean? So, yeah. um, so you've only got to make one or two bad judgments on players. And then, and then Terry Neal comes in and he sees it a certain way and he's going to buy what's available, what's not necessarily right to make changes because Terry Neal, it looked like, and remember he was good for me, it looked like he had a problem with the senior players in the team. And I thought Terry Neal, I've always said Terry Neal was only 34 when he took over. Well, I've seen that lately that he was 32 when, when he took over. I mean, wow. that is some job for a 32-year-old. That's so very young. When you're playing with Martin Peters and Martin Chivers and Pat Jennings and, you know, Alan Gills, it, I mean, whoa. So, so you've only... Terry Neal moved on to the Arsenal, of course, and washed my mouth out. But, um, you know, if he's not too worried, he, he wants a result now... And not worried about five years' time. Um, you know, and he did improve it. He saved us from relegation. And then I think from nearly relegated, we got to ninth the year before. Again, not good enough. I'm not saying it's good enough. Mm -hmm. But he picked players to improve us now. Right. And, 
and moved on and then almost left the baby with Keith. And um, and Keith was young, young, not as not as young as Terry Neal, but he was naive as a manager. I think it was Keith's first job. And I was probably young as a captain as well. So in amongst everything, uh, this great club suffered the, the oh, what's it called? Um, the denigration of, of relegation. And, yeah. you know, thank God, thank God there was not uh, social media at the time. Because I, I can think, imagine. I think no one would have recovered from that, including me. And I think I was quite strong mentally. That again, coming back to my attributes, <laughs> I must have had something and and being able to keep playing, keep doing it, driving on, not getting too down, being consistent, sticking to my game, um, loyal, of course, but that wasn't proven at that stage. But, um, but yeah, I mean, how I would have coped with social media, I do not know. Well, Steve, I'll tell you one thing you. For someone who was so good for our club, you, you are very humble. So what I'm going to do then, to make it less humbling for you, I'm going to ask you about some of the other players you played with because you can sing their praises. It's easier sure. than singing sure. your own. Um, but uh, I love that, that you're so humble. Um, I, I sat down earlier and I looked at like 20 to 30 of the players you played with in your time at Spurs. You know, the likes of Archibald and Hewton and Gilzine and Knowles and Roberts and Mullery and... Our dealers and Vit. I mean, you played with some great players. So would it be would it be easy for you if I said who were the best three players that you played with? Would that be easy, or am I asking a really tough task there? I always think it's it's. Um, I answered this one day. They said, um, I think it was Norman Giller on my podcast said, you got one game that you have got to win. Right, and you can pick one player. You can pick one player from all your career. Wow! Oh, so what it led me to think: How can you judge a Jimmy Greaves, the ace goal scorer, the the professional goal scorer? Yeah, against the Pat Jennings. Yeah, who plucks one out the air, throws it to Nolsey. Nolsey don't have to touch the ball because it's got the perfect arc on it just coming round onto his left foot um, and he don't have to touch it to the halfway line. I mean, that's tempo. That's yeah. keeping the tempo, raising the tempo. Whoosh. So, so um, let me put it another way then, Steve. When, 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 if you are Spurs fans from right the way through the years, Spurs fans will always tell you it's these three players. Now, I, I only saw two of these play, but Spurs fans will always tell you that it was Gaza and then going back, it was Hoddle and Greaves. Now, you've played with two of those, right? You played yeah. with Hoddle and Greaves? Yeah. So easy to judge a player you've played with. Yeah. Ron Hoddle was the best technical player I ever played with. Now, that sounds an easy thing to say, but when mm. you've played with our dealers and you've played with Martin Peters, and you've played with some amazing footballers, amazing footballers. Um, Glenn Hoddle had the nerve to get the ball surrounded by two, maybe three players, maybe not four, because, <laughs> yeah, he had to be some player to get out of that. But yeah, he, and you'd have to be a mug to pass it to him, because if four players are there, they ain't got four players somewhere else. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? So someone's in a better position. But but I I paid Glenn the compliment that the the more, and I've said this in a team meeting, and I, I kept pumping the fact, the more Glenn Hoddle had the ball, the better team we were. <laughs> and and that's fact, and no one could argue with that. And Glenn could see a lot of players can see 60 yards away but they can't always deliver what they see. <laughs> right. They not all could deliver it left and right foot. And there's a lot of people still today that don't know whether Glenn Oddle was a left foot or a right foot. <laughs> Do you know the answer? He was obviously a right footer, but, but, but I mean, you couldn't tell that from his game. Right. And 
Leonardo practiced these things. And I, I, I give Glenn credit, shall I? When you walk into a club as a 15-year-old from school or 16 years, as it, as it then became in later years, my era was 15, his was 16, and you can see and walk down the same corridors as Glen Oddle and walk past them first team training and walk past seeing Glenn deliver the killer ball, like the quarterback ball, and practice his free kicks, top corner, bosh, or at the bar, underneath of the bar and in. You know, when you see one of the top talents you're ever going to have the pleasure to watch, as one of your players and he's homegrown. And actually, me, I'm the captain. I've gone from the youngest to the oldest in the end. <laughs> yeah. And so young players had a stature, homegrown players had a stature at Tottenham in my era. Do you know what I mean? They had a yeah, stature. yeah, sure, sure. And I think I think too many clubs don't really, they've got a youth policy. Don't really believe in it. Don't mm. yeah. the manager has to be sort of forced to? Where did I the other day? I heard uh, an Arsenal director where the the board asked him to ask Wenger, would he play some youngsters or put them on a sub now and again? And Wenger said, no, young young players make mistakes. Wow. So, I mean, where where would Tottenham be today without Harry Kane? Okay, not necessarily today, but in the last five years without yeah, yeah. goals. And the best player I've played against is George Best, homegrown. Whether anyone could say they actually produced George Best, <laughs> I'm not quite sure, because that was some unbelievable talent. But Can I ask then, Steve, as, as someone that's played against George Best, now obviously I know he's not Tottenham and this is Tottenham, whatever, but fans like me, I, I can only watch... You know, obviously the Messi's, the Ronaldo's, the, you know, yeah. the, the Ronaldinho's, they're all fresh in our memory of the last 10, 15, 20 years. But I can only watch videos of George Best. Was, yeah. is he underrated by fans in this era? I mean, was, was he that good? Like, was he, was he world, the world's best good? Was he that level? Well, he wasn't rated as world class because he never played it on the World Cup stage. Right. And why was that? Because you know he played for Northern Ireland. Um, I my sounding board is Pat Jennings, right? On, on George Best, and you know, if someone tells you an inside story about Paul Gascoigne, it will always be the funny thing rather than the football talent thing. Right. Right. Because that overtakes especially in time, it overtakes what what it was about. It was about playing football. Right. So George Best had 10 years at the top, apparently didn't get on with Bobby Charlton. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. Bobby Charlton would have seen him as a different type of era, different character, too flamboyant for him, uh, didn't play the game like, um, like maybe the manager wanted it. He would probably ignore uh, yeah. instructions at times. And, you know, all, all the great players do. All the great players do. You've got to have some consistency in your team. So I come back to me again. You need the player who, as Bill Nick would say, as I walked in the door, Steve, if you play quick, easy and accurate, you'll have a career. <laughs> okay. So you weren't telling me to go and be a George Best. Look at George Best. Get some videos of him, although they weren't videos in them days. But go and see some film of George Best and do what he does. Yeah. No, we're different. His body's different than mine. His balance is different than mine. And, you know, I, I, I make the point that, you know, when Bill Nick was very hard with money and I got brave one day and said, Bill, you know, I've realised, you know, I'm not Jimmy Greaves. I've realised I'm not Alan Gilzean. I'm, I can't, I, can, I haven't got a left foot like, Cyril Knowles, I can't smash the ball like Martin Chivers, etc. But do you know what? To have those special talents in your team, you need a few of me in the team as well. 
because we're the ones that do the not the donkey work that's the wrong word but the consistent things like a midfield general like i said the, i decided the the more glenodo has the ball the better team we are so guess yeah. who my first look was <laughs> yeah, glenodo. Glen. glenodo and sometimes i would use it because they would be expecting me to but graham ricks who was a good friend of glenn all the time i'd look at glenn and he'd think here it comes and he and i'd I'd play it behind him rather than in front of him. Do you know what I mean? Because good players read you. Well, you've got to be a good enough player to read what they're going to read. So, um, Glenn, just incredible. Jimmy Greaves only played with for six months. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't know what was going on in behind the scenes or whatever, but look at that man's record. Just oh. look. And he knew... Jimmy Greaves was an attacking maestro and he knew, yet he knew what the defender was going to try and do against him. And the number of times he waited, waited, waited for him to catch up and then nicked inside him. He knew that they had to get on the line between him and, our, and their goal. And as soon as they got on there, he would nick inside because he worked against their momentum. So, I mean... All, all great players have, have their move. Mm. Stanley Matthews was touch it with the inside, but then outside. Boom, boom, to beat, oh. beat the fullback. So Cruyff and all these special ones. So um, it's good that I can talk about the special ones because I weren't one of them. But you have to... You, you were to the Spurs fans, Steve. You were oh, to the Spurs yeah. fans. Okay. okay, so do you know what I, do you know what my link with the Spurs fans were? I was homegrown. And I don't think they could see their self as a Glen Hoddle. I don't right. think they could say, oh, I think I could have hit that ball. Yeah. <laughs> but they could have... They think them. they could do what not Steve Perriman does, do yeah, they? I know that they? I'll tell you what they would have said to themselves. If I had the chance to wear that white shirt, I would run about, I would put my foot in, I would hunt... I would give the ball to someone who's better than me. And I, I typified what the majority of the supporters were thinking if they were young enough to have something left in their legs to go and play. Yeah, the ones yeah. who were too old and sit in the West Stand in the old stadium and they've seen it all and they got the cigar on, they didn't want to be Steve Perriman. <laughs> not a chance. <laughs> not, not a chance. But Steve, can I... Can I, I, I just, I'm just conscious that you, I know you've got about nine, 10 minutes left and I, I just want to make sure that I get read, read some questions out from the fans. Sure, if that's sure, okay. please, um, please. And, and um, yeah, coach, uh, coach Silver said, Steve, you're a legend because you did always make time for the fans. So um, I think that's, that tells us what sort of a man you were. Or that, are. Again, that again was the era that we played in Cheshunt football club, Cheshunt training ground. People turned up as long as they stayed behind the rope. Mm. We paid them the respect of signing whatever they bought. Perfect. For the training ground. And that's how it wasn't seen as special. It wasn't seen as doing something that that we were doing them a favour. It was what you did. Mm -hmm. Do it right. Steve, Bill Nick said to me one day, Steve, just do it right. Do it right and the money looks after itself. Absolutely. So I'm just going to give you some quick fire questions, yeah, Steve. Sure, um, sure. So Paul G has said, uh, where do you think we will finish this year, Steve? Uh, we'll be fighting for third and fourth. Okay, like that. like that. I've got us down for fourth, but I hope your third is correct. Well, um, I, I hope so too. I mean, let's let's hope for better than that. But um, yeah. but that will be a, a that will be another step without with the players' knowledge of what Conte wants and to lead us on a stepping stone for, again. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, KJ Hotspur said, Steve, who is your current favourite Tottenham player and why? It can't be Son and it can't be Kane. Um, good question. Um... Okay, 
I think he's getting a bit too much credit at the minute. So I'm right. going to do it, which is dangerous. The Swede. The Swede, oh, the Swede is, when you've got all that talent in the team, I, some of the talent that is shown in, say, the last 10 games, so I'm talking about the end of the season, I don't really think it's him. I think he's he's in a purple patch. But when he when he settles down to his game, so I think he's playing above himself at the minute, and then eventually you come down to some level. Mm. I think he's what the what the team needs with regard to the work rate and the industry and the competitiveness. I phoned my mate in Sweden, said, Go on then, tell me about him. He said he don't take no prisoners. And if he plays 42 games a year or he plays a full season, 38, he'll get 10 goals at least. So um, I see him as a bit of a Tony Galvin. Mm -hmm. um, he's, he's, he's appeared to be a bit better, not than Tony, but a bit better than what he really is. But I think even when he comes down a peg, he'll be what we need uh, in okay. terms of balance. Okay. Cool. Um, Football Ferreira has said, what was your favourite goal in your career? Favourite goal was the goal against the Arsenal. Um, uh, down the tunnel end. What's that called? Was that Park Lane? or Anyway. Um, cross comes in. Mike England heads it down. And I read it like I'm telling you about... Bill Nick used to say to me, Steve, Steve, anticipation, son, anticipation. <laughs> and, and he used to describe it as, you know, if you're driving a car, of course you're driving your car. You've got to be driving the fellow in front of you, the fellow down the side of you, and the fellow at the back of you. Yeah. You can't just drive your – you can't just play your game. You've got to know what they're doing – or likely to do. And um, anyway, I read perfectly that Mike England was going to win the ball. And I come off of Alan Ball. So it weren't like I was, he was sort of marking me, but in the end he weren't. And then I just got on it and half followed it straight in the top of the net. And we won the game 2 0. I finished up with the biggest black eye you've ever seen from Liam Brady's boot. But it, it was more as much my fault as his because I bent too low to get the header. And um, that gave me the most satisfaction. Well, wow, what a sweet strike. You know, when you... I'm when you've caught it right. But <laughs> when you catch it right on the half volley and, and it went above uh, Pat Rice's head, between Pat Rice's head and the bar, it went amazing. What a goal. So... Next question is from Ellie. Now, Ellie used to play for Spurs ladies for about a decade as well. Hi, so, Ellie. Uh, Hi, Ellie. Uh, Ellie. Ellie's a big fan of Hoiberg. So she said, I love Emil Hoiberg, Steve, as he reminds me of you so much. What player in our current team reminds you of any player you played with? Uh, sorry, just say that again. So which player that plays for Spurs right now reminds you of a player that you might have played with? I know you said Kulisewski, maybe yeah. a bit Galvin-like. Yeah. Um, uh, well, I, I just think it's such a different game now. Um, mm. uh, I can't say that Harry Kane was like Chivers because they score goals different ways. Um, uh, very difficult. That Probably, no worries if not. Yeah, I, I, so I go for Kulu again with, with Tony Galvin. I know it's a bit of a but I, I like Hoiberg as well. I like him. Um, he's going to get shown up on different days. I'm very worried for him when he when he first came in and did so well. Then all of a sudden we were getting chasing in misfit midfield and his legs was being shown up and players around him weren't taking enough responsibility and it was all coming down to his shoulders. So people that thought he was the best player one week were thinking he was the worst player the next. And it was all about what was happening around him. So um, 
I know exactly about that position. I was in it hundreds of times myself. And um, it's nice when you've got a, 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 when you see something quick and you can play it off. He's that yep. type. He's the same as me. Um, but according to that strike, although was that better than my Arsenal strike? Probably not. But, uh, <laughs> he's, he's, it wasn't. He's, it wasn't. But he's got a goal threat, that's for sure. Yeah. Uh, last three questions for you, Steve. Uh, the first one is from Paul G. And he said, is there any particular trophy that stands out for you in your career? So if I'm not wrong, Steve, you won, was it two League Cups, two FA Cups and two UEFA Cups? Yes. So the FA Cup 81. Why? Because I had a bigger input into that team uh, mm -hmm. than I had in the 70s because I was just right. a, also ran in that. I right. was a... Uh, sort of not a main player, but I was a main opinion um, alongside Keith of that early 80s team. And the fact that we got relegated, albeit came up the first year, you're not really back on the big stage until you win a trophy. Right. And it was vital for us to win that game. I mean, wow. <sighs> Looking back, I'm even nervous thinking about if we'd have lost the first game, which we could well have done. So, to win it in the style that we did put us back on the map. And I always say when you win the first trophy, and it wasn't my first trophy, but it was first trophy for some time, when the club wins its first trophy, you're halfway to winning your second one. Mm. Okay, this is, this is the last question for the fans. Then I've got one final question for you before I let you go, Steve. I'll kick myself. I don't ask you. So um, this one, I, I do like this question. Ellie again has said, do you feel like we need more Hoddle-esque or Gaza-esque type players in our current team so we can break down the high pressing and the low block teams well you've always got to you've always got to have good players and you've always got to have the ones that can open the opposition up mm. so the problem is that that the game has become more systemized now and you know it's easier to destroy than create mm -hmm. absolutely easier I had a career out of destroying, um, uh, starting off our creativity, but but this, first my job was to sort right. of get close to the opponent, etc. So um, you can never have too much in your team of that. And uh, Gaza would open you up, but I'm not sure he would as much in today's football. Glenn Hoddle could deliver that ball into spaces. He found spaces that weren't there. Mm. I, but to find another Glenn Hoddle, well, <sighs> you, um, who's the fella? Dembele in midfield. Oh, Musa. Um, yeah. So that they are around, but uh, it's, it's going to find them. And um, but, but maybe this fella, this um, uh, um, the chap from Brighton, you know, maybe... Oh, Basuma maybe is going to be that type for us, but uh, can I just tell you a couple of things I don't like? I don't like the socks fully full, uh, fully pulled up. I don't like going on the knees to celebrate a goal. You're an inch away from getting injured. I mean a bad injury. Do yourself a favour. And I'm not sure about the the shirt over the uh, over the hands at all. No. <laughs> so, Steve. <laughs> Last question from me. I know you've got to go. Last question from me. This is a big debate that lots of Spurs fans have and have been having for years. We haven't won a trophy for what will be 15 years in May. Can we count what we're doing as success until we actually have, until we actually win trophies, Steve? Is, is that the benchmark for you of a successful team to win trophies? Um. Yeah, absolutely. Because our team had to compete with a with a magnificent Liverpool side, for mm -hmm. instance, or in Europe, Real Madrid or Barcelona or or Bayern Munich and stuff. Mm -hmm. You you may not be as good as some of those teams, but you've still got to compete with them. You've still got to compete, and the best way to compete is is to to beat them. And I think the the confidence goes up in your team when you've got that. What they do in 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 Italy, they they you, they put a special thing on the badge when you've won the league. Oh, they put, yeah, the star. Oh, okay, 
failed in my career 17 years we never we never i mean we did threaten the league once but but um uh yeah um just it's the it's really for the supporters the the trophy absolutely it's for the supporters but it's for the players confidence as well and gives you the the stepping stone onto the next victory or victories so yeah. um I, I yeah i think we've got we got to win any trophy that's going be it a sensible one not a pre-season one and uh, <laughs> you know win win the league cup to start with win, yeah win, win the league cup go on then go and win that one yeah won't, won't be easy by the way won't be easy so no it, it, I, i've always said it's not easy because you know you have got city liverpool you know chelsea but like like i think i've heard you say before Steve, it, it's a cup run, right? It's it's six games to win a cup. Um, but Steve, I, I can't thank you enough. I know you need to go, so I can't thank you enough for, for giving us your time. My um, and um, look, I, I hope you enjoy the rest of this season. Yeah, and um, I, I look forward to seeing your next podcasts. Thank you to all you Spurs supporters that are listening. Thank you for your loyalty. Sometimes that loyalty is tested too much. <laughs> um, but I think maybe, maybe you're going to get, we're going to get some joy this year. Um, you, because I don't go regularly to Tottenham, don't believe that I'm not a Tottenham person through and through. I wasn't, I wasn't, I got turned around as a 15 year old. The, when I walked in that door, you could not be anything other than a Tottenham person. And when you got people like Bill Nick and Eddie Bailey teaching you, and their staff, well, you you better be a Tottenham man, otherwise you ain't going to survive here. So the fact I don't go that often does not mean I don't care. And I do not need a Tottenham badge on my blazer or my suit or my sports shirt or, uh, what do you call it, a painting on the wall. I don't need that to, to tell you lot that I'm a Spurs man. If... I don't think anyone would think that at all. You are the record appearance holder for Spurs. I can't see that ever being beaten. And it must be something you're incredibly proud of. I got introduced that the other night, my record. And I, you know what I said? I'd heard it on the radio the day before and I stole it. I said, wow, I'd be very proud to meet him. <laughs> I said, there is, do, do you know off the top of your head, Steve, how many appearances you are in front of the person in second? And do you know who that is? Uh, Mabsy? It is. It's Gary Mabbert. Yeah. And so you got what, depending where I read, you got either 854 or 866. Yeah. Do you know? I don't know. No. And no. Mabbert is back on 611. That's how many times you represented the club we love. Well, if you think you get in at 17 yeah. and you stay for 17 years, 17 more years, yeah. and you have very few injuries and you're lucky enough to any operation you need to have is in the summer, mm -hmm. you don't miss games in the summer, um, it would have to be, I think, a homegrown goalkeeper that gets in at about 19, right. who plays all those years, and beyond my age to get those number of games. I hope someone does it. I really do. But uh, it's very doubtful. I, Steve, I can't see it. And if it is going to happen, Kane's going to need to play for another decade, I think, if he's going to yeah, take that off of you. <laughs> maybe, maybe you can go out on the, on a wheelchair and play. Absolutely. But Steve, listen, I, I know you've got to go. Good luck with your podcast later. Thank and much. thank you for always having the time to, to talk to me on text as well. I do appreciate it. Thank you. you. Good luck. Eh? Up the you spare. take care. Come on then. See you later. <laughs> Cheers, Steve. Bye-bye. Yes. Bye-bye. Everybody, I um, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, I will just stay on for another couple of minutes. Um, let me know what you think. Uh, should we try and get some more Spurs legends on? Um I know there were a few people in the chat, uh, some of the younger fans asking if Steve played for us. Yes, Steve didn't just play for us. Steve played for us 866 times over 17 years. He could play central midfield. He could play central defence. He won the League Cup in 71 and in 73. 
He won the FA Cup in 81 and 82. And he was one of only three captains in the history to win FA Cups back to back. And he won the UEFA Cup in 72 and the UEFA Cup in 84. And he was Footballer of the Year in 1982. So um, what I would suggest, if anyone doesn't know who Steve Perriman is, definitely go and, go and have a look. Um, Full Ball has said, uh, I'll tell you what, I have reached out to Janola um, so many times, Full Ball, uh, with no response. I, I, I can't imagine that I'll ever get him on. Um, and I can't imagine there'll be any easy way of getting hold of Paul Gascoigne, but that would be a good one. Um, also, I just want to make a good, a good point I saw, uh, Peter Simons. I agree. This is this is one of those things. Um, this is one of those things where I think the difference in football now to then was UEFA Cup then wasn't like the Europa League now. It was a huge deal. It was a massive deal, wasn't it? Um, and, um, and, and you know, to win it was, was really, really tough. But I think what was more telling for me, and you probably all think I'm a little bit cheeky at the end of getting that question in about what defines success, is I keep seeing a lot of fans say, oh, well, success isn't just measured by trophies. Um, and what concerns me is we've got Steve Perriman, who I, I don't know if anyone can answer this for me, but I believe he's the most decorated player of Spurs history. I don't know if anyone can name a player that's won more than six trophies for Tottenham. So if we've got the most decorated Spurs player in history telling us that it's about winning trophies to be successful, how can we have fans that say it's not about winning trophies and it's about just getting top four? It will always... It will always, always baffle me. Um, what do you guys think? Let's have that conversation. What do you guys think? Is it about winning trophies? Is it just about getting top four? Is the money more more important nowadays to the club than it is for fans to win trophies? Because I look at it like this. As a club, if I put the business hat on, I get it. You want top four, Right. Let's just assume you can't do both. Obviously, I'm a big advocate of you can. If you can't do both, top four gets the club money. But as a fan, I've still not won anything at the end of the season. Yeah? I've still not seen anything. But if we win a cup, those memories don't go away. Those memories do not go away. I can still remember right now, um, I can still remember right now, being in, at the FA Cup in 91, I was what, 10 years of age, being, uh, you know, there for 91. I was there for 99 to see Everson, uh, Everson. It was actually, it was Everson, wasn't it, who run down the line and, um, you know, Alan Nilsson with a diving header. You know, I was there in 08 to watch Jonathan Woodgate score the winner of Chelsea. Those memories for me, they're there. Not losing finals, not losing semi-finals, those ones, the winning ones. So, um but yeah, I mean, Peter, you, you know, when you say we want to be at the top table, who at the top table doesn't win trophies? There's my question to you. Great player, by the way, Cliff Jones, from what I've been told and, and seen videos of. Uh, Andrew Gregory, correct. I, I agree with this. Um, I, I completely agree with this. Top four is an achievement. Winning cups to success. Two very different words. Um Golden Boot 23, Levy has bought a solid foundation. Now it's time to back the manager. I, I can't agree more. I think um, a lot that happened yesterday showed me we're still not a great football team. I think we've got some great individuals, uh, but I feel like there's a lot that needs to go into it. But guys, I am going to wrap up there. Um, look, it's been absolutely wonderful. Always enjoy it. Uh, you know, always get a little WhatsApp from Steve, See, check in, see if everything's all right. Um and a really nice guy and he agreed to come on um, and, and hopefully everyone enjoyed that. So please uh, do me a favour. If you would like to like, please do. We've only got 89. If we get this to 100, if 11 of you could just go and smash that like button now. If after the show finishes, anyone does want to leave a super thanks, that money does go to charity. So please feel free to do that. Um, and I will be back on Wednesday night with Henry Wright from Henry Wright TV. Savarin Wright live tonight where we will recap all of the weekend's Premier League action and we will look forward to um, all of the Premier League's action next week, as well as looking at the transfers. Um, I'll just sign off by saying 
Uh, the fact that I've seen Spurs linked with no one lately apart from Ghana of Man United kind of sums up where I think the club are and our lack of ambition. Very disappointed, I must say. I know there'll be fans wetting their pants talking about the future and how good we're going to be in five years. Been hearing that for 20 years. Needs to be now. Much love, everyone. Thank you very much for all your time. And just to say, uh, we may have back and forth on here, but it's all football. It's all love. It's never personal. I really do appreciate all the support that I get from you guys. Please go over and subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Um, I do always see that 50% of the people that watch my videos don't actually subscribe, but they're watching every week. Um, so look, please do go and subscribe. I'm on the road to uh, 2000. We'll have to get them in the next couple of weeks. And I love you all. And I'll see you soon. Take care, guys. Bye-bye.